Thank you for coming again to uh, MSUE's Lunch and Learn series. This one, this Lunch and Learn series is focusing on food safety for those that feed a lot of folks, either using prepared foods or in a food pantry situation. Um, I'm Monica Smith, I'm a registered dietitian and I'm the extension educator here in Kent County that deals with food and nutrition. And I just want to remind everybody that the USDA is graciously bringing you this programming and we don't discriminate against anyone, nor do we associate with those who do discriminate. So you can always feel welcome here and know that your participants of whoever you are serving or working with is also welcome. And we also want to encourage anybody that's eligible to apply for food stamps, right? It's fully funded. We want people to have the nutrition that they need. I really want you folks to understand foodborne illness when you leave here because this is something that's almost 100% preventable. Um, food doesn't stay protected by itself. We have to do that. Left to its own accord, food will not stay safe. Um, usually foodborne illness is caused by bacteria or other pathogens. How many people in here are working food pantry situations? Okay, how many people work in situations or volunteer in situations where you have large group meals? Does anybody do that? Okay. Um, other pathogens in food might be chemicals, might be particulate like glass, wood. Um, anybody ever worked in a restaurant? Ever had a manager cringe because somebody ran a, a glass into the ice dispenser? Oh, yeah. How to have to clean out an entire um, ice dispenser you know, in the middle of a busy rush because now you don't know if there's any glass particle in that ice cooler or not. How many people have ever had the 24-hour flu? <laughs> Guess what? No, you didn't. <laughs> there is no such thing as a 24-hour flu. You had food poisoning, okay? So something you ate was not safe. This is widely underreported because we all think it's the flu, right? We'll feel better tomorrow in two days and three days, and most of us do. However, some pregnant women, some children, some infants, some elderly, and some compromised people die. About 5,000 people a year die from foodborne illness and almost 100% preventable. But you know, not all bacteria in food are bad, right? There's cheese, there's yogurt, you know, yeast. What would we do if we only had unleavened bread? It would be a boring world, wouldn't it? So it's not all bacteria, it's just some bacteria. Has anybody ever seen these? indicators before these four things are the key to being careful cleaning separating cooking and chilling and what it really comes down to is nothing is safe once it's been prepared for more than two hours at room temperature hi come on in nothing come on in join us so once you've hit that two hour mark, hey Mike. So once you've hit that two hour mark, you, you really are walking on dangerous ground. 90 degrees, one hour. Does anybody have a company picnic? Does anybody have a 4th of July family gathering? You do not want me at that. <laughs> because um, I've got the timer set on the table, you know. I want to put everything up. I want to put everything up, you know. What's a prepared food? Uh-oh. This is important. Any food that's been cooked, any food that has been cooked, even rice, even pasta, a lot of people, oatmeal, a lot of people don't think that those are high risk food, but they are. Bacteria love them. It's carb, right? It's glucose. The world survives off carbohydrate, right? Any fruit or vegetable that has been peeled or sliced, those baby carrots that you get in the store that you get may get donated, the peeling is not intact on those. Those little baby carrot shorts, those did not grow like that, you realize it, right? It's full-size carrots that have been ground down. The peeling has been compromised. They must stay refrigerated. 
okay? I once had a little kid ask me, how do we grow the little ones? He didn't mean baby carrots, he meant the shorts. Any type of deli food that's prepared. Only exceptions, bread, cookies, crackers, some whole fruit like grapefruit, right? Oranges, some whole vegetables like potatoes. Um, some people would argue with me and say eggplant, but I'm gonna tell you what, eggplant's not gonna last long at room temperature. They're kind of fussy. So any prepared food, you've only got a two hour window of opportunity or it has to be refrigerated. Uh-oh. The thing that nobody wants to talk about, especially with volunteers. How many people in here are volunteers? How many people get paid so little they might as well be a volunteer? <laughs> 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 so when you're really working hard for not a whole lot of money, or when you're really working hard for no money, it's really hard to tell people that show up day after day, hour after hour, that they have to be um, clean in a way that is safe for food. In other words, you need to let people know this is an important event. It's important that we get our stuff out. It's important that you make how many? 2,000 lunches a day? Plus, Plus 2,000. Imagine it. You've got 2,000 sandwiches being made maybe in a, in a very few hours. If you had a fever, diarrhea, or nausea, or runny nose in the last 24 hours, you really should not be on that line. Your heart is in the right position, but you really shouldn't be there, okay? If you have an infected wound or cut anywhere on your body, how are you gonna screen for that? You're sitting there, the masses are coming into kids' food basket, they're getting ready to make the food. What are you going to say? Hey, got any infections? <laughs> it's kind of a tough one to ask, isn't it? But infection is body-wide, right? If you've got something that is infected, a tooth, a cut, you really should not be handling prepared foods, period. And if you have a non-infected wound or cut on your hand, you should not only glove, you should bandage after washing. So I think a real challenge for people doing in service to others, trying to feed people, is getting past this barrier. Are you well enough to be here? Though we desperately need your body. You know, are we going to compromise those that we're feeding? Wash your hands frequently. Eating, drinking, smoking, touching your face, ears, hair, clothes, garbage using the restroom, coughing, sneezing. You think that's pretty common sense, right? Trust me, it is not. You need to go over this with the people that, that you're working with. This is not common knowledge. Oh, everybody knows they need to wash their hands after the restroom and coughing and sneezing maybe, but a lot of people don't see smoking as a place where they can begin to transmit foodborne illness. <clears throat> A lot of people don't realize that, you know, putting their hair behind their ears, they think they're doing um, a favor, right? They're getting their hair, gonna put their hair in a place where maybe uh, hair won't fly, right? Let me get it back out of the way. Yeah, need to wash your hands. Even if you just washed your hair this morning, you need to wash your hands. Washing hands before and after handling raw food, prepared food, or produce. What if you just handled, pro do you wash produce before you use it? Yes. Do you wash produce before you store it? No, if you wash produce before you store it, what's gonna happen? Yeah, you're gonna have some slimy produce, right? So if you're handling, let's say you've just gotten the great good fortune of a pallet full of, pardon me? Head lettuce. Head lettuce, yeah, that's a windfall, right? <laughs> you just got a windfall. If you're touching that lettuce, moving it, preparing it, getting it ready to go, you need to wash your hands before you go on to the next thing because whatever's on that lettuce is now gonna be inoculated into the next thing, right? Does the lettuce look dirty? Probably not. 
But it's, it's not just about dirt, is it? So you don't want, if you're going to have lettuce and you're going to have apples, and if there's two different things on each of these, do you want to combine them? No, you don't. Here's another one. Let me tell you what, I was the most unpopular person at MSUE when I came to work here and said there will be no food prepared in this kitchen given to any person that walks in this building without, if you are not wearing a hairnet. Boy, was I popular. <laughs> People, we need to wear hairnets when we're preparing food, breaking down food, stirring food, serving food. Hair needs to be restrained. Hey, that's a lot better than it used to be. At least we have those little boofy looking caps now, right? Does anybody remember the Ruth Buzzy look? <laughs> the real hairnet? Listen, when I was a teenager in North Carolina waiting tables, we had to get what was called a health card to wait tables. And you had to have a TB test, a blood test, I don't know what they checked, and you had to wear a hairnet waiting tables. Talk about good for tips. <laughs> okay? So they're better than they used to be. Yes, ma'am. Can you wear a hat? You can wear a hat. Your hair needs to be restrained. You could wear a kerchief. Okay. Something needs to, be, needs to restrain your hair. I'm a big fan of this, the clean disposable apron. Does anybody here have an animal? We all have hair. What's on our clothes has the potential to fall into the food that we work with. I'm a really firm believer in aprons. We buy the plastic ones here, one use and trash them. Then we don't have to worry about it. Here's another one. Do not wear jewelry, false nails, or nail polish when handling food. False nails are a harbor of bacteria. They just harbor bacteria. So when you're handling prepared foods, that really, you really should not wear false nails. Nail polish flakes off. That becomes a particulate, right? Jewelry. It's pretty hard to clean and wash your hands well enough, to scrub it well enough, to get the stuff out of a piece of jewelry that's like in a setting. A wedding band, not so much, but something with a setting. That's hard. What do you think about this? Gloves are not a substitute for hand washing. They're not. They're just one more barrier. Here's one that nobody wants to get grasp hold of. Hand sanitizer is not a substitute for hand washing. You have to wash first. 20 seconds. 20 seconds. That would begin now. La 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 la. La washing hands, washing hands, washing hands. Thinking about everything I could be doing besides washing my hands. Looking around, looking around, wondering if I'm going to have any skin left. Washing my hands, washing my hands, washing my hands, washing my hands. That is what washing your hands is. Wow, it's a long time, isn't it? I've never really understood the concept of a finger towel. Has anybody ever seen one of those buy finger towels? What is this? <laughs> towel. What is that? That is not hand washing. Disposable towels. Does anybody use non-disposable towels in their agency? It's, it's eco-friendly, but it's not food safe. So, if you're going to do clean, these are the kind of things that you should have where you are preparing food. You should have a hand wash. Oh, wait a minute, I forget, I got a gizmo here. Ah. You should have a sink with warm, hot and warm water. I walked into a restaurant, yes, when was it, two days ago to eat. I ordered my food. I went to the re restroom to wash my hands. I had a sign of employees must rest, wash hands before returning to work. The water did not get hot. I walked back. I said, cancel my order and refund my money. The water in your restroom does not get hot. What are you washing your hands with? That's the second restaurant I've done that to. Warm water, soap, disposable towels make for a hand washing station. A hand washing station is not liquid sanitizer. That is not a hand washing station. You should have some kind of apron and hair restraints unless you ask your volunteers to bring that for themselves and gloves. And maybe bandages. 
That way, if somebody shows up, they've got no Band-Aid, you've got a Band-Aid, you can at least keep them working, right? Transportation. How many people transport food? Uh, prepared food or non-prepared food? Both. Non and both. Okay. Here's another one that's hard to tell people. Get the dog hair out of your car. If it's mine, vacuum the hay out of your trunk. Okay? Car needs to be clean. And the food needs to be kept out of the danger zone. There's your danger zone up there between 40 and 140. That's just the bacteria happy time. Happy, happy times for bacteria. Every minute that food is in that danger zone, the bacteria are multiplying and having the best of times. So that means most folks, if you're going for any length of time, cooler. I used to volunteer eons ago with Meals on Wheels. I thought that cooler was the most irritating thing in the world. I didn't know any better. I did it because they told me to do it, but I didn't like it. You know, it would have been so much easier if I could just put that stuff in the front seat, right? Now, you think I wouldn't have to say this. Do not transport garbage in the same vehicle that you transport food. How many people are in a rural area? How many people know that people have to take their trash somewhere? How many people know that people are saving money on gas right now? Well, I'll just run to the grocery and stop at the garbage place, right? It happens. Yeah, it happens. Don't do it. Don't mix food items with non-food items. Have you noticed at the grocery store when they're bagging your groceries, they'll put your cleaning products in one and your food in another? They're doing that for a reason, not to use more bags. So you really want to continue that practice. And again, do not let perishable items sit in the danger zone. If you don't know how long something's been in the danger zone, get rid of it. Does anybody have any idea what one trip to the emergency room for a foodborne illness not if you're hospitalized, just if you feel like you're going to die and you need some fluids. Does anybody know what that cost? A lot. Pardon me? It's going to be expensive. It's between $600 and $1,000 depending on what doctor sees you. Is it really worth it for that $1.98 package of bologna? Get rid of it. It's hard to throw food away, but it's harder to poison people. Okay. Prepared foods, meaning you could be feeding a group of people, right? You're having a big volunteer thing, your appreciation thing at your agency. Or maybe um, I just started to do a little bit of work with a church in town that holds a, a dinner once a month that feeds people once a month. They can come in and eat for free, and they do some fellowship and stuff. They do that. Um, holding prepared foods may mean getting a prefer, prepared food donation. Does anybody glean food from an organization like a, a restaurant sends soup, salad? What else do you get? Uh, we get a large number of uh, restaurants as a whole conglomerate of uh, that many volunteers. So it could be anything. It could be sa anything. Rice. Uh, you know what you have to watch for. Yeah, rice you have to really watch <laughs> for. So Lots of different things, gravies. Yeah, gravy's another one. So if you're getting prepared foods, either because you are gleaning them, you're preparing them and holding them, you're feeding people, um, or you're going to put them on in your food pantry's box that month. For example, um, anything that's been sliced is a prepared food. So if somebody donated to you, I don't know, three cases of sliced cucumbers, in the package, those are prepared. So you need to know how hot, you need to know how cold, you need to know how long it's been sitting at room temperature. And for hot food, small batches, shallow pans. Say it with me. Small batches, shallow pans. Thank you. I know it saves room in the refrigerator to have a pan this tall and this narrow. That is scary. Scary, scary, scary. You know how long it will take the inside of a pan like that to cool to where it's safe? About 40 hours. <laughs> you might try it tomorrow and it could still be warm. Yeah. That's frightening. Frightening. So small batches, shallow pans. Don't add new stuff to old stuff. 
I know it makes you have to wash more pans, doesn't it? Take the old off, bring the new in, don't mix them up. Keep foods covered and keep utensils clean. Meaning, in the ideal world, when you change the pan, you change the utensil, right? Because then you're just going to inoculate anything that was in the old into the new. And then it becomes a self-perpetuating nightmare. My ex-husband was uh, a Marine. And we had recently, at that time, back in the 80s, had just become vegetarians. And he used to get a lot of ribbing for being a vegetarian, okay? You know, he's not tough enough. Nobody wanted to be with him when they were out in the field. Blah, blah, blah. Well, he comes into work one day, and an entire battalion. You know how many people are in a battalion? Thousands. I think it was 2,000 people. He was the lone wolf standing. The hospital was full. The spaghetti was evil. <laughs> Then he was able to remind them, wow, guys, if we'd been in the field, I'd have been the only one there to save your sorry selves. <laughs> Woo, all of a sudden, there was a new respect for vegetarianism. <laughs> okay? And to, to have that many people, that was virtually every plate of spaghetti they served was bad. They had to have something self-perpetuating, right? Something kept infecting something. So you can't tell by looking how many people with prepared foods actually have a thermometer on hand. Woo, only one. You need to have a thermometer. <laughs> Mike, Mike, who likes food safety even more than I do, will give you one. So there's different kinds, you see. These test meats and other cooked products, but then there's ones for the refrigerator and ones for the freezer, too. But you're not going to know if these are done. If you, don't, if you don't temp them out using the thermometer. In the center, away from the bone, okay? There is, this, these are not compromisable temperatures. 140 isn't 145, 160 isn't 165. This is really the temperature that you have to hit. It's very important, especially if you're serving elderly or folks with diabetes, chronic heart disease, anybody that's had a recent surgery, infants, these are, these are vulnerable folks. Do you think that people in poverty are at a higher risk for being ill than other people? Yeah. Research is showing that. Why do you think that is? They, all, they always have good access to nutrition. What do you think the stress level is when you're worried every day about survival? What does that do to your body? It wears you out. It just wears you out. So there's your danger zone again. Shows again, if you're a graphic person, this is the same thing in a different format. You really want to make sure that you keep cold foods cold, hot foods hot. So if you're chilling and you're cooking and you're keeping things to the right temperature, these are some of the tools that you should have. That's for the cooked stuff. That's in the refrigerator and or freezer. Here's another one that you can use if you like either one of these. But you have to follow manufacturer's instructions about where these hang. You don't put them on the door. They have to go into a certain place depending on how they're made. Does anybody use these, these like roaster things? You know what you've got if you've got one of these. You're going to come pretty close. You still need to use your thermometer and temp it out, but these are really pretty good about holding at an even temperature. I always get nervous if I go somewhere to eat and they've got those little chafing dishes with the little heat thing underneath it. Oh, that's nice. Thank you. Hmm, yeah, where's the salad? And I hope that's been washed. So this you know better. You may tell I'm a little, I'm a little bit of a germ phobe. <laughs> I've had food poisoning, I've been food poisoned multiple times. So I'm, I'm a little bit anxious about, about food and bacteria. Receiving foods, evident pest damage. Does anybody get that? You get a case of something, you see it all the time, don't you? Yeah, you got to get rid of it. If, you, if you've got foods with pest damage, you, you need to either take it outside, completely clear it out, make sure, because the chances are the pests are still there. And then you're just inoculating them into your facility. Does a roach like anything better than cardboard? I don't know if they do or not. They love cardboard. They love paper. Um, 
discard foods with compromised packaging. Oh, I'll just put, oh, oh, it's torn. I'll just put it in a new Ziploc baggie. That would be no. Once it's been compromised, it's no longer safe. Um, significant dents. I'm not talking about a ding. I'm talking about a dent. Um, anytime that there are uh, bulges, rust, protrusions, those are not safe. Um, keep dry foods dry. It's not, you, you, you shouldn't put dry foods in the refrigerator, right? It creates moisture. But some people think the refrigerator is the safest place in the world to keep food. It's really not for everything. Put foods away promptly. Is this a problem for anybody? The truck comes in and there's nobody there to unload it that day. And then it's the next day or the next day. That's got to be a challenge. Because sometimes you just get food whenever it's given to you, right? You don't, may not even know it's coming. You might come in one day and, and there's that lettuce. Ooh, lettuce fell from heaven. That's interesting. Now where am I going to put it? You know, I so say you need to know when it came, when, when it got there, and you need to get it moved. This one hurts. If you don't have the capacity to deal with it, don't accept it. How many people would struggle with that to say no? It's hard. It's really hard to turn food away, isn't it? But if you don't have the, if you don't have the ability, if you don't have the place to refrigerate it, to freeze it, to store it appropriately, you should not accept it. That's hard. <sighs> Label all your food. Everything that doesn't have a label on it should have a label on it. Just the other day, one of the instructors here, we send um, instructors into six different food pantries in the area. And quite often when we get to one of the food pantries, they will find something that's been repackaged, right? So she comes in and she says, what is this? I said, well, I'll bet it's a grain of some sort. Didn't know what it was, when it was repackaged, how to cook it. So, of course, we play around with it to figure out what it is. But do you think it does? What if you were on the receiving end of that? How would you feel about receiving it? Does it give you much confidence? What do you think the chances are you're going to use it? Because, listen, nobody's more curious about food than we are. We'll go in the kitchen and dink with it for three hours to figure out how to cook it because we're just like that. <laughs> but you're stressed. You're in poverty. You got two or three kids. Do you really want to spend that kind of time to figure out how to cook this unknown thing? No. So not only do you keep it safe, but you increase the chances that it will actually get eaten by the person, right? So the name of the food, the date it was <coughs> prepared or received or um, separated, if that was the case, and the date to discard. Does anybody know the maximum lifetime of a leftover prepared food? <coughs> Three to four days. Three to four days if you keep it at the right temperature and it hasn't been sitting around everywhere. Now if it's been sitting out on the table all day like my mother used to do, I cannot believe I'm here to tell the story. <laughs> and that's probably why I'm so susceptible to foodborne illness now as an adult is because my mother would cook on Sunday, we'd get home from church, she would cook on Sunday, that food would be on the table all day long. Basically, she cooked and said, don't speak to me the rest of the day, even I need a break. I fed you, here's enough to get you through the day. It was good. I'm just glad I'm here to tell the story. And initials of who packaged that food. Why do you think you should initial it? You can ask questions if something goes wrong. Yes, sir. If I package that, and tomorrow I call in sick, maybe that food ought not be going out. <clears throat> first in, first out. How many people find this a challenge? Rotating it, if it's heavy, too. Potatoes, number 10 cans, cases of stuff, that gets to be a challenge. You know, but that's important. I like this, not fish. First in, still here. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
New items go in the back and or on the bottom. Move the older stuff in the front and to the left. So that implies that there would be enough room on your shelving to manipulate your food. Who has a problem with leaving any open space on shelves? I know you do. <laughs> I've seen, you cannot put a piece of paper between two items on the shelf of a kid's food basket. Okay? So that's as big a challenge for some people, leaving some space to work with as it is to say no. So the first item out should always be the oldest. Data mark everything. Storage time for prepared food, three days with no more than two hours at room temperature total. You can stretch it to four if it's not an awfully food unsafe food. How many people struggle with expiration dates? You know what? We can put somebody on the moon. We have seen other galaxies. But we cannot agree on a food dating and coding system. Do we need to realign our priorities in this country? I don't know, but this makes me crazy. It makes me crazy. Sell-by. Well, guess what? The sell-by date isn't even for you. It's for the store. So you get home and it says, well, sell-by 222. Should I eat it? Well, what does that mean? Do I have a week to eat it? How long do they think it should take me from the time I buy it to the time I eat it? It doesn't. It just tells them how long to display the product for sale, and it may have something to do with quality. It may have something to do with the fact that they've got a contract to move so much um, item. It may have nothing to do with food safety, okay? Best if used by. This is not a safety date. Can't tell us why. You cannot tell them that, can you? If you open that can and ate it yourself, they'd look at you like you were a fool. You're right. They would look at you like she's going to drop. <laughs> but it is simply a quality issue and a quality that you may not even be able to tell. Okay? It's, it could be very low, very little, min minuscule changes, or it could be big changes, especially if, if it's a nutrient issue, meaning vitamin C is pretty fragile. It doesn't hang around real long. So it can also mean that the quality of the nutrient may or may not be where it started at, but it is not unsafe. Use by. The last date recommended for use of the pro product still at peak quality. We're still not in a safety situation here. But who wants to get a product that says, I used to be better than I was. I used to be better than I am right now. Take me home and use me. I'm not going to put you in a pot of chili and ruin a whole pot of chili with you. You may not be up to par. It's very hard to convince people it's okay to use product after this date. But it is. This can become unsafe, an expiration date. And you won't see this on hardly any food. You will always see it on infant foods. You will always see it on formula. But you're not going to find many manufacturers that are going to step out on this limb and tell you this. You'll see it in very few foods that are designed for adult consumption. <clears throat> yes, ma'am. So on a can that we get that has a, a, a date on there that says um, it was back December 31st of 2009. Um, how far can you go? Yeah, how far out can you go on that? For, and this is really hard to believe, if you've got a, a canned food product, meaning it is canned in metal, I'm not talking about those aseptic packages, canned in metal, okay. if it is a low acid food, like green beans, potatoes, beets, carrots, three to five years, okay? It's a long time. I see someone rejoicing. <laughs> I see you rejoicing in the back. I've argued the point so many times. Yes. Now, high acid foods do not, do not fare quite as well after that date. So high acid foods would be tomatoes, salsa, fruit. Uh, pickle products are usually in jars, so you don't have the same thing. One to two years past that date. But it's still a long time. Now that's assuming that we've got intact packaging. You've got no bulges, no 
no significant dents and no rust. It can go for a long time. So, like evaporated milk, that's you're up to five years. That's a low acid food. Protein is not the problem, it's acid. But if it's a, a say if we get a cottage cheese or a yogurt that says um, expired date. Now that's not canned. No, but is there a shelf life that, I mean, or a... Most people would say no. five to seven days. Oh, really? Most, if you have assured yourself that it has always been at the correct temperature. See, we don't know that. So we, and you don't know that. We throw that stuff out of the... Better safe than sorry. Yeah. Okay. Frozen meats, if you could speak to that. I don't know if you're going to get to it. Uh, I can speak to it right now. Frozen people meats. People have a tendency to, you know, they get something in, they put it in the freezer, they might forget about it. might be there a year, you know. They pull it out. Is it good? Can they use it? When you freeze something... Imagine freezing as suspended animation. <laughs> freezing does not kill any bacteria. It just stops it in its tracks. So from the point of freezing something, it is always safe. It is safe until the next eon for months, years, decades. If it has not thawed, it has remained at temp. It's safe. Will the quality change? Yes, indeedy. So after about six months, you're going to start to see a quality change. Um, after one year, you're going to see a more significant quality change. Um, food, prepared food that goes into the freezer cold will hold better than if you take it warm and put it in the freezer because the ice crystals will be smaller if it enters the freezer from a cold state. But once you freeze it, it is safe on and on and on and on until you bring it back up to temperature where the uh, bacteria can grow. So it can stay there. The only exception I can think of to that is that mold grows in, in um, a frozen state. Bacteria does not grow. Bacteria mold. does not. Mold is a different thing. And mold is a fungi, okay. and they've been here from the beginning of time, <laughs> and they will be here long after we are gone. <laughs> So mold is different. With Mold is about um, humidity. It's not about temperature. Mold doesn't care much about temperature if it gets hot enough, but mold can endure very cold temperatures if it's got humidity. Should you have humidity inside your freezer? You shouldn't. If you do, you need to have the freezer person come out and look at your freezer because you, you should not have humidity in your freezer. There's a sealed problem or something is wrong that you need to have investigated if you're growing mold in your, in your freezer. Yes, sir. Uh, we just received 40-pound uh, boxes of cubed apples frozen. What do you do with that if you're a pantry? This has remained a problem since the beginning of time, and hopefully in a very short period of time, um, Feeding America may have the answer to your prayers because they are learning now and have a facility now that will allow them to break down unsafe foods that would be unsafe to break down in your pantry. Um, because if you do not have the training or the facilities to do that, you should not break it down and you should give it away in 40 pound increments, which means you should have me over to teach people how to make applesauce. <laughs> so it can become an applesauce extravaganza. You can freeze it, those 40, those, well, those bags. Comes frozen. Comes frozen. We, it frozen, but I'm and we just got it, so I'm curious as to what can be done with it. You're going, you really should not break it down if you do not have the facilities and the training to break it down. Um, you shouldn't attempt to make the applesauce yourself and give that away either. No, you should, not, uh, you should not attempt to can your own applesauce and give it away because then you're opening yourself up for a whole host of problems. Mm -hmm. But you could certainly say, come to our applesauce making workshop. We'll send you home with a 40 pound bag with all the work done and all you got to do is stir and we'll show you how to do it. But that is a problem. This happens all the time. The 40 pound block of chicken, the giant thing of, of ham. Hey, I've got a question. Um, uh, in, growing up in church, um, they bring in these big packages of chicken, break it up or cut it up. Um, season it and then freeze it. What does that do to the meat quality? Is that even safe? No, it's not safe because once you open that bag of chicken, what have you done? Exposed it. You've exposed it, whoever touched it. Now it's in the situation where you could have inoculated it with something that is now in 
suspended animation. But hopefully if you cook it to the right temperature long enough, you'll be okay. But it will be ever so much safer to freeze it, thaw it under refrigeration, giving yourself plenty of time, then season it and cook it to temp. Okay? Really so much better. Most churches and pantries aren't going to have refrigeration large enough to thaw a 40 pound bag box of chicken. Mm -hmm. you know, this is a problem. We should not get it. <laughs> this is a problem. You're going to give up? Are you going to give up a, that big of a chunk of your refrigerator to thaw chicken? And you're waiting, waiting, is it done yet? Is it done yet? I could really be like putting some food in there, right? Why would you want to thaw it out? Because if you're going to cook it, you have to thaw it before cooking. The food pantries don't do that. Cooking. Some of them do if they're having churches do. Like this gentleman said, you know, his church may receive it and then they may feed the masses. A lot of folks do that. Again, stay out of the danger zone. Here's one. Now, there's some conflicting information out there, so I took the least of the two. Everything says keep food six inches off the floor. Some things say four inches away from the wall. Some things say two inches away from the wall. But be sure that you keep it a minimum of two inches away from the wall. Four inches is probably better. Off the floor, okay? I go into lots of places and I see dry goods sitting on the floor, canned goods, cases of canned goods sitting on the floor. You're just asking for a pest control problem. Is that what a pallet is? Um, your going to be about four. A pallet's about four inches, and pallet is is not <laughs> as good as shelving because the wood, pardon me, invites pests. It would be better if you had it, the optimum. I'm talking about I'm talking about utopia here. Okay, I realize that I'm talking <laughs> utopia. <laughs> you, you, no, I realize that we don't I'm all have. This, I think we're one of the almost one of the smallest pantries. Yeah. Areas. It is hard. A lot of us don't have access to Utopia, but Utopia will be six inches off the floor on wire shelving for optimal safety. Or a plastic Or plastic is nice too. Here's one. We got this issue here. We got one pantry, must stock all. That means we have some cleaning stuff that's got to stock in the same area with our food stuff on the bottom, away from food items, not above, not side by side. So you got dry storage, refrigerated, frozen. Cool and dry. Low humidity, moderate temperature. Good ventilation. Okay, if you've got everything crammed up against one another and you have a high humidity day, now you've got a mold situation, right? Mold doesn't like air so much. Keep food out of direct sunlight. Area clean and dry. Plastic rodent proof containers. These can be a significant investment. These are not cheap, I get that. But this is the safe way to go, although there can be some really good sales, especially if you get them after Christmas, the ones that may have been designed to put Christmas ornaments in. There's no reason why you can't put bags of rice, bags of dried beans, bags of pasta in those. For some reason, if they're red, they go cheap after December 25th. They tend to sell them too at um, secondhand stores if you're disinfected with them. Oh, yes. Don't ever negate going to the Goodwill or the other secondhand stores to find these. Scoops and gloves. You think because it's dried beans, you should just maybe like reach in there with your hands? I've seen it. Don't, I've really actually witnessed that. You know, have a handful of beans, go into the bag, and no. So if dry food storage, these are the tools that you're going to be needing. Of course, like again, I said this is utopia. Good shelving with ventilation, not solid shelves. Plastic rodent-proof containers. <laughs> if you'll notice, this is a super snazzy one. It's got wheels. <laughs> That's really a nice one, okay, and these scoops so that people can actually, um, and also with the scoop you're not up into the products, so that makes it nice. Thirty, and that should say to maintain an internal temperature to 39, to maintain an inter internal temperature of 38, 37, 38, 
Because if you set it at 37 or 38, every time you open it, it's going to keep rising, right? So you want to set it at 39, um, and it should maintain at 39. Maybe it, ours goes down a little bit. It goes down depending on what's in there. Um, does everybody have a little dial in their refrigerator that says 8, 7, 6, or it might say 25 degrees or 37 degrees? Don't trust those. Spend the 8 bucks on a thermometer and use that. Record them every day. Every single day. What if my pantry isn't open every day? Then every day that you're there at least. Don't overload. Refrigerators do best with air space. There has to be room for air to circulate. A really packed refrigerator is not going to hold the temperature good. Use open shelving in refrigerators if you have the choice. If you were going to buy one, one that's got um, metal grate versus the solid glass is the better choice. Plus it's easier to clean too. Keep refrigerator doors closed as much as possible and make sure your food is wrapped properly. Raw meat, poultry, and fish on the lower shelves separate from ready to eat food. What's the problem with this? Here we have meat. What's down here? Produce. Okay. <laughs> so there's a problem with that in most home refrigerators. In commercial refrigerators, it's not that way. So in home, if you've got meat here, it should be sitting on something. You will notice, I doubt you can see it from there, though. There is a plate that this meat is sitting on. It's not just right onto the rack. But you certainly don't want to put the meat up here to drizzle, dribble down all over the place. Everything that should be in the refrigerator. Anybody remember the day when we kept eggs out on the counter? Long time ago, probably before, now they estimate over 85% of all the commercially um, producing chickens in this country have salmonella, maybe greater percentage than that. <laughs> it's really not, yeah, not to mention everything else. So freezers are at zero or below, not 32. At zero or below, that's where suspended animation takes in. Full freezers are best. The more you've got in the freezer, the better off you are except when you need that thing that's at the bottom, <laughs> right? Yeah, that's the problem. You got to get the thing that's at the bottom. So packing the freezer full is going to get the best temp, and will hold the longest in a power out, but it's a challenge to get to the bottom. It makes that first in, first out thing hard if you got a well-packed freezer. You want to do your freezer temperatures daily as well? Frozen food deliveries in the freezer immediately. Long ago and far away when I was a Hojo girl, when I worked for Howard Johnson's, just like Rachel Ray, I could have been her. <laughs> um, that's a whole nother, that's a therapy issue. But um, we actually, when we received our food, I don't know if anybody's ever eaten at Howard Johnson's, but they had like 32 things, different varieties of ice cream. We did clams, we did fish, we, had, we got a lot of food frozen. The truck packed, when the truck came in, the, uh, the situation in the store was such that there was actually a door cut right into the freezer that you opened up and they loaded directly from the truck into the freezer. Um, some of the trucks even had a conveyor that just went to that and then you just stood in there and unloaded the food. It was a marvelous setup. It was horrible when it was your turn to be the freezer lady too because it was really cold in there. Um, if the food's not label it, label it. What is it? When did it go in? Well, you say it's going to be safe. Why do I want to know when it's going to go in? Because if it's been in there six months, it's going to make a better casserole than it's going to make a roast chicken, right? You're going to get, if, if I'm going to pull a piece of meat out of the freezer that's been there six or eight months, I'm going to make it with a sauce. I'm not going to put it on the grill because I'm not going to have as good a quality. Of course, keep the door closed. Thaw frozen foods in the refrigerator. On the counter at room temperature is just begging for uh, foodborne illness. Shallow containers and frozen foods as well. And if you want maximum, you want maximum quality, you need to use storage containers designed for the freezer. Yogurt containers are not designed for the freezer. They're permeable. You don't want that. You're not going to have as good a response to it. So 
you want, if you're storing food and you're, it's worth using the energy, it's not free to freeze something, is it? Costs good money. If you're going to put it in there, it's going to take your valuable freezer space. Don't you want to use a, a food packaging that's going to let you get the most out of it? Sure. Power outage. How many people have had this fear? Had a woman call me last week. She was relatively calm, but I could hear the tremor in her voice. I am a small business owner. I have a pizza place. They're shutting my power off for four hours on Wednesday. She was trying to remain cool. What do I have to do to not lose everything I have? So I was like, wow, you're really smart. You don't need to worry. This is what you need to do. But she was in a panic. My guess is that she had just gotten the truck, had just come in, and now she gets, and then she gets her notification. So don't open it. If a food is partially thawed, meaning there's still ice crystals, it's still solid in the middle, you can refreeze it. It's going to be safe. Quality's going to change, though. Okay? Completely thawed foods should probably be tossed unless you know at exactly what point if you took that thawed food out and you put a uh, thermometer in there and it said 37 degrees, that food is still safe, right? Cook it, eat it. If you put a thermometer in there and that food said 42 degrees, it's out, it's trash, discard it, it's not safe. Again, basically like the dry things, 50 to 70, discard damaged, clean and dry. <clears throat> Wipe cans with a clean, disposable towel before opening them. Do you know what the health inspectors love more than anything in the world? Your can opener. Guaranteed to grow something if you don't really take care of it. Wash your can opener, wash your cans. Here's one that a lot of people don't think about. If you have volunteers that are dying for something to do, have them seal windows, seal doors, weatherproof your pantry, your facility, your windows, doors, pipes so that things can't get into your facility. Get rid of the garbage quickly. Keep your outside garbage cans covered. Clean up spills. Here's one. Get rid of old mop water. If that mop water's been sitting there for three hours, what do you think's living in that? Do you really want to spread that all over your floor? The airtight, pest-proof containers. Always keep, be looking at your packages for evidence um, of insect or rodent control, a rodent um, infestation. And if you find that, you need to call somebody to take care of your problem. If you're feeding other people, it's probably you probably should not be doing your own pest control. Lowest shelf in the refrigerator for meat, fish, and poultry. Of these three, what is the most fragile? Red meat, poultry, or fish? Fish. It has the lowest fat content. It'll go the quickest. It won't survive long. So that's got to be a quick turnaround time, meaning you either cook it quick or you freeze it quick. All right? It, it doesn't last long. Airtight packaging. Always thaw in a pan in the refrigerator. Eggs immediately in the refrigerator. Don't wash eggs before storing them. Their shells are permeable. You don't want to do that. Things go in, things go out. Use um, shelled eggs within four to five weeks of the packing date. You got a long time on eggs if held at the right temperature. Don't freeze eggs in the shell. But they can be cracked and frozen. But if you do that, then you're risking inoculating bacteria into that product. First in, first out. 40 degrees or less for pre fresh produce. These can be stored at room temperature. Don't wash it. We talked about that. Some of these can be stored in a cool, dry area off the floor. Um, does anybody find produce a challenge to receive or to keep? 
because if you've got one thing in there, if you get that big donation of lettuce and there's four at the bottom, squished and in not such good shape, then that sets up the entire, the, the entire packaging, whether it's a crate or whether it's a skid for, for falling apart. So it's really important that you get fresh produce separated if there's a chance that some of the produce is, is uh, marginalized. You have to want to make sure that you don't end up with any of this stuff in your food. Um, and it happens a lot. Cleaning versus sanitizing. You get the dirt off and then you sanitize it. One to ten bleach, right? One, per, one part bleach, ten parts water. It's cheap. It's not pretty for your clothes. You can also use a, a, a sanitizing product that you can buy on the shelf that's designed for that, but it's going to cost you more money. I just read an article that you can use peroxide in place of bleach. Do you know anything about I would disagree with that. Peroxide breaks down much quicker than bleach. Okay. And peroxide, though it can do some things, there are viruses that peroxide is not going to kill. And what comes to my mind right away is hepatitis. So I, you can't beat bleach, but like I said, well, peroxide can mess your clothes up too, though. So clean, rinse, sanitize. Sanitize means you spray the surface and ideally let it dry. If you can't let it dry, you wipe it dry with disposable towel. At least 30 seconds, let it sit there, okay? Dishcloths, oh, I can't spell it. It's not dishcloths, it's dishcloths. Sponges, <laughs> don't use them. So everything you've got to do has to be, everything you touch needs to be clean, needs to be sanitized before and after using it as a work surface. So if you clean it and you set a box of food up there that you just received, you start unloading the food, you move the box, that area where the box sat is now unclean, right? That's why carts are so wonderful. You pull the cart up and you don't mess up your countertop. 76 million with a foodborne illness in 2008. That is highly underreported. 325,000 hospitalized. That's a lot of money and a lot of inconvenience and a lot of suffering. 5,000 died. Our vulnerable folks are highest risk. Most of these were preventable. So, these are some things I'd like you to think about. This will be this presentation will be on the website for you to download within the next couple of days. There's also going to be a handbook. I think it's about 15 pages that you can download that goes through all this that you could use as handouts for volunteers that goes through. Um, I gave you the cooking for groups. Uh, cherish that. You can download those from USDA now, but you cannot get them from them. You can't get them as a printed copy anymore, but you can download them if you want to download them. So there'll be a lot um, of resources available on uh, the internet at the www.kentnutrition.weebly.com website. Um, and I thank you for your attention and I appreciate all the work you do in helping us feed folks in our community that maybe can't um, right now have the foods to feed themselves. You're welcome. Does anybody have